Okay, um, I stopped the previous recording because I got a text message from my kids who I had promised to take to lunch, and they were ready, so I had to stop. So I apologize for that, but I'm going to continue now and finish this lesson on color. And I just want to recap. <clears throat> um, what I did in a previous... I want to make sure I can see this. Yeah. Okay. This being the master, the standard nig used in the dark room, and this being the unknown. So I know what it takes to print this. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. I know, and and this is supposed to be this. I mean, this is the master of that. And if I use 30 yellow and 30 magenta, light level 2.2, 10 seconds, I'm going to get this print. So that's a known, and that's maintained. And this is the Macbeth color checker here. And so if I measure the film base with a densitometer, I get a series of numbers, which tells me something. I measure the film base of this film, which is obviously a different color. I compare the difference, and then it gives me a deviation from this, not only in color, but a deviation in density as well. So I know how to print this um, using data that I got from this. That's the whole idea behind utilizing a densitometer. Um, and I had said that if you're printing color, you really should have a densitometer. And before it was kind of out of the reach of most darkroom enthusiasts, unless you were professional, because it cost like $5,000, um, different models, you know, it's 3,500 to $5,000. Uh, but now you can pick them up for like $200, I mean, on the market. <clears throat> and so anyway, what I measured from this was 41 on a red filter, 70 on a green filter, and the blue filter gave me 136. That means that the blue light that penetrated this film was stopped by 1.36 density. <clears throat> 0.3 being one stop. So over four stops it's it's very yellow which is <clears throat> the opposite of blue so that makes sense red light passes through um gives you a density of 0.41 and the green is prevented by uh two and one third stop okay this negative gives me a reading of 32 67 87 okay again red green blue i compare um, this overall density with this overall density by taking an average, I just add these three, divide it by three, I get 0.82. Um, I do the same with the unknown, I get 62. So this is two thirds of a stop lighter than the master, which means since it's lighter, it's going to require less exposure. So I come up with a density difference, you're going to need to subtract 37% from whatever this required to print this neg. That's your your um, <clears throat> density. And I get that from this chart that I had made, which I suggest that you got write down copy because it, it converts <clears throat> densitometer measurements into density that you can use in the dark room. 0.3 is one stop, so if you're exactly 0.3 off, then it's easy to calculate. You just, if, if you are denser by 0.3, you're going to have to double your time. If it's less dense by 0.3, you can cut the time in half, and that's equals one stop. But if it falls in between that, that's the uh, <clears throat> chart I, gave, I made up. So 37% less exposure for the this unknown.
um, filter pack and exposure leg. Okay. Then on the master, I take 136 minus 41. The blue minus the red gives me 95. The green minus the red, 70 minus, it gives me 29. That's my deviation master between the blue to red and the green to red. So in a sense, this is my aim. Okay, And that's what the enlarger accommodates <clears throat> when he uses 30 yellow and 30 magenta. Okay, So in order to print this gray or this black, that's the deviation that is known. <clears throat> now we know the deviation for the end known. 87 minus 32 gives you 55. 67 minus 32 gives you 35. <clears throat> the difference between this is 40 yellow. 55 is 40 less than 95. And 35 is 6 more than 29. Okay? So when I subtract this from this, I get 40 yellow. When I subtract 32 from 29, I get a negative 6. And that's what I do to this. So now, instead of 30 yellow, I should use 70 yellow. I should write this down. I didn't have a chance to explain this that well in the previous video because I cut it short. But 30 yellow, 30 magenta, 2.2 light level at 10 seconds. Okay. So now I'm going to use 70 yellow because I'm adding 40. And I'm going to use 24 magenta. Still, I'm going to use 2.2, but now I'm going to use 6.3 seconds instead of 10 for this negative, for this one, okay? So that's a recap of what we arrived at in the last video. And I had used the film base to measure because I wanted to, because uh, I knew you could see the film base. And so as a demonstration, I grabbed, this happens to be a 40 yellow CC filter, which if I put here, behind here, it immediately begins to look like this. And I put a five green, which is the opposite of magenta. So minus six magenta would be adding six green. This is a five green. I put this behind here. And now this begins, this film base looks like that film base. And that's the reason why I used the film base so that you could see it. Ideally, you actually want to use the gray, okay? Um, I'll explain why more later, but um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the densitometer. In, in the lab business, there's a, um, a lot of equipment. A paper processor could cost anywhere from sixty to $100,000 depending on the size. Um, darkroom and largers, anywhere from uh, three, four, five, six, ten, you know, eight by ten larger might cost you twenty-five thousand dollars, depending on which one you get, or more. Video analyzer. A video analyzer is basically a TV monitor. You you stick the negative into video analyzer and gives you an image on a TV screen and you can adjust it. You set it again to a master and you know that what it'll print like and then you dial in a correction, a deviation from the master and then you can see that, oh, now the skin tone looks better, the gray looks better and you give that deviation to the darkroom technician. It basically does what 
I just did, but it does it in a way that you can see, so you don't have to use all this math, okay? The math is built into it. And a Kodak PVAC video analyzer was like a hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Um, film processors, you know, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars, depending on how fast they are or how big they, how wide they are, and so forth. So, in, in short, there's a lot of investment in building a color lab. That's time was five thousand dollars. And you'd be surprised how, you know, people were kind of forced into buying intensive timer because they had to run control strips, which, you know, every day you run these controls and you would plot it and know that your chemistry was doing what it's supposed to do. And they thought, well, $5,000 for this year. But this is the most accurate piece of equipment in any given photo lab. Okay. And well worth $5,000 and it certainly is worth $200, $300. Um, I'm going to try to focus in on this so you can see this. When I depress the light um, collecting device, it sh you want it to read zero, zero, zero. So transmission, red, green, and blue, all zero, zero. That means it's collecting all the red light, all the green light, all the blue light that is passing through these scientific red, green, and blue filters. When you play something in front of it, it prevents some of the light from passing. That's the whole idea. Okay, so we're going to take this green, this five green. Now, by the way, this five green filter, which I purchased from Eastman Kodak years ago, they weren't cheap, but they weren't that expensive. They were fairly expensive. They're certainly more expensive than the CP filters because CC filters, again, are made... Um, they're gelatin filters, so the, when the light passes through it, it doesn't distort. So you can actually put this behind the camera, um, be, behind the lens in the camera, to color correct your exposures. That's what they were made for. Or you can put it in front of a lens and photograph. So if you wanted to change the color of the light passing through your lens to accommodate... Um, to color correct the existing light, you would use CC filters, and that's what they are made for. You can also use them in the dark room, above the film, to color correct, or even below the lens. That's what gelatin filters are good for. Okay, I'm going to measure this. Okay, and uh, hopefully you can see this. It says red is 15, green is 10, blue is 15. So you got point. Um, 10 of neutral density there. You got, ten, you got 10 here, 10 here, 10 here, and you got an excess of 5 here and 5 here. That's a 5 green because it's allowing 0 0.10 of green light going through, but it's stopping 0.15 and stopping 0.15 of blue and stopping 0.15 of red. So it's indeed a 5 green. The densitometer verifies that this is a very good and very accurate filter and it's more accurate than your enlarger so when you dial in five magenta or subtract five magenta in your enlarger it might be four it might be three depending on the gears and um like i said in a previous video we would take an on easel analyzer something like a densitometer upside down dial in five and see what it read the needle moved only three points and we know that oh that's actually only three so from zero to five, you're only getting three. Then we move from five to 10 and see what it is. And we would map out every enlarger and store that information in the software we wrote so that when I went to this particular dark room, um, I knew how the filters behaved compared to uh, what was truly 
0.05, okay? So this is a real 5 green, is what this densitometer is telling me. That's why the densitometer is the most accurate piece of equipment that any color lab would have. And it's not the most expensive, it's the cheapest. It was hard to convince people this because nobody wanted to do the math. They didn't want to learn this stuff. Let's look, let's look at the uh, 40 yellow, okay? So red, you got 0 0.09. Green, you got 0 0.10. Blue, you got 0 0.50. So again, you got 40 more than red. What's collected through the red filter and what's collected through the green filter. Indeed, this is a 40 yellow. And this is more accurate than pumping in 40 yellow in your larger again. Um, now, ZBE in Santa Barbara, they did make a CC reader, which is a really nice thing. You would retrofit your color enlarger by putting these sensors inside the mixing chamber so that when you dialed in uh, yellow, it would give you a numeric readout. And you would ignore what the dial said, and you would look at the readout, because then you were assured of getting 40 yellow, even though you dialed in you know, 50. You were, in fact, getting 40. So a CC reader was fitted in all our enlargers as well. Um, anyway, that's I don't think they make them anymore, but that was a really neat unit that Zach... Um, designed at ZBE, and they still make the Chromara uh, printer, <clears throat> digital printer for C-prints. Okay, so, therefore, when I, um, <laughs> treat this negative with this filtration, it will supposedly match this. Let's do that, okay? So I'm going to put this here. Can you see this now? So what basically what I'm doing is okay, what I did before was I measured this and got the readout. Now I'm going to leave this here, both of them. And now I'm going to read this, which is the unknown name. Okay, I'll read the film base again. And the reading I get... Sometimes when I, when I do this, I think you can see what I'm doing. You're not, okay. Okay. So now I'm getting before this is what I got. With these filters in place, okay, and then reading the unknown, I'm now getting red, green, blue. Six four nine four and one sixty. It's been this is totally different from this now. Okay? If I do the same math, one sixty minus sixty four, I get six point nine six. Okay? Difference. And if I put 94 minus 64, I'll get 30. So now, before I got <laughs> um, these two numbers, now I'm getting these two, okay? Now look at this. This is 96. The aim for the that I got from the master was 95 it's very close right this is now 30 and this is was 29 can you see that can you see that I want to make sure this is
This was the beginning from the master. 136 minus 41 gives you 95. 70 minus 41 equals 29. Before, we were only getting 55 and 35, so we had to do this to those numbers. These filters essentially does that. And now, when I measure the density of the unknown neg with the filters also in the <clears throat> densitometer, I get 96 and 30, which is, this is 95 and that's 29. See how accurate the densitometer is? If you have accurate filters. It's simple math. There's a lot of steps. And logically, you have to follow what it means. But it makes sense. <clears throat> Visually, it makes sense too. Because when you do that to negative, you can see it. So that's the math. That's the math that you do. If you use a densitometer to get a starting filter pack on your uh, for your any any neg that you're going to print that you haven't printed yet, then you have to maintain the master. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. <clears throat> it's important that you get this because we're going to continue now. We're going to, I'm going to build on this, okay? <clears throat> like I said, most people didn't know this stuff because they didn't want to know it. But the information was there. Uh, Code I gave classes and so did Macbeth. Um, this is not a Macbeth Nest Tom, but this is a X Rite. It's got Noritsu's name on it because Noritsu hired us to write software for them. They used our software for the control strips. And they put their name on a X Rite Densitometer. Okay. I had said that you don't really want to measure the base. Because, I mean, so you get the same exposure to get your blacks to match. Well, it's the grays you want to match, okay? And the reason why you want to match the grays is because a slope, okay? Just because you get this correct doesn't mean that that's going to be correct. I'm going to do a very simple... Graph. This is if you followed along all these lessons, which I started almost two years ago. During the course of the zone system lessons, I draw graphs, film a film graph of you know black to white. Okay. So this is a, a film curve. Now, when you deal with color, you have three of them. So you would draw a red curve and a green curve and a blue curve. Now, the red curve looks like this. And maybe the green curve looks like that. And the blue curve might look like this. It fits here in the gray area, but it spreads in the high values and spreads in the blacks. That's your film slope. Ideally, you want the three curves to match perfectly. And sometimes you can do that. You have the right emulsion. The chemistry is just right. Everything is perfect. And you get all three. Now, these are not raw densitometer readings. These are printing curves. They're, you have to take the densitometer readings, convert them with a algorithm that predicts how paper is going to respond to that. And that's that was in our software and it's, it's complicated. 
I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> you don't need to know that. But anyway, it doesn't fit perfectly. It, you, this is where it has to fit. This is what you see. Okay? <clears throat> if you... This isn't quite gray. You don't notice it until you print it down. If this isn't perfectly a gray black, you don't notice it unless you make it very light. So everyone's always trying to balance this because that's what the human eye sees the most. That's your straight line portion of the curve. So that has to fit. So that's where you want to measure your unknown and compare it to your known. And that's why in the 60s, when I first started working in a color lab, the first frame of every row, the photographer would shoot a gray card. Just a card, that, white and gray, and just shoot it. And then he shoot the rest of the row. And the next, he changed the roll of film, and then he shoot the gray. We would use that gray card to measure this and compare it to the master, and we get our filter pack for that roll of film. If he went into a church and it was a different lighting, he shoot another gray card. That was the way photographers were trained in those days. Now they don't do that. Actually, they stopped doing it by the 70s. People got lazy to just shoot and give you this film and you had to figure out what the starting filter pack is. And people started buying video analyzers. Well, that's the Thomas way to go. So when you do this math, when you do all this stuff, do it on a gray or the skin tone. You, you generally have either gray or skin tone. But measuring this, comparing it to the sidewalk or, um, you know, something gray in the, you know, this is pretty gray, this is pretty gray, you know. There's a lot of, you know, then you can get a fairly accurate, the density might be off because if you're comparing a light gray to a dark gray, then you know that, oh, it, the density is off because um, you should find something similar to this density if you're going to use that patch. or this. Our software memorized all of this, okay? And so it would, you would be able to just choose which one. Does that make sense? Okay, now, slope. They had automatic printers that would just basically scan an egg and the, the software would recommend exposure and print it. And that's how one hour labs operated. <clears throat> they just, they didn't test, they just print, 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 print. So obviously those printers are very expensive. Um, and they had built in slope. And what that means is The masters that they used for those printers came with a normal over and under. Sometimes they had two over and two under. Three point slope, four point, five point slope, right? In essence, what you need to do is you need to print these all gray. This, this would be printed lighter. This would be printed darker. If you overexpose this it, and print that negative to be gray, because this would be exposed way up here and now you print, that would constitute your over. You underexpose this same scene, you would be printing that lighter to make it gray, and that would constitute your, well, you don't need, you just use the same neg and you get your normals, and this is your normal, this is your under, and that's your overexpose, right? And you find out that when you print a darker neg it has a different filter pack it doesn't use 30 yellow it's going to use 40 yellow or 20 yellow okay and in order to print this you know and as well as the magenta you may have to you know it's going to take a different filter pack to make that gray different filter pack to make that gray so when the one hour photo lab would print a neg that was little overexposed or way overexposed it would know oh you need to add 10 yellow here it's that much overexposed oh you have to add 20 yellow 
that's slope. So it would adjust your um, filter pack along with your exposure. If you happen to have a perfect neg, it didn't need to make any adjustment. And that's what I like to work from, perfect negs. Because then, when you're dodging the shadows, they don't go green on you or red. When you lighten things by, by cutting the exposure, by dodging, or when you start burning, you don't get these pink highlights. Um, it was essential for me to have good, balanced color negs when I masked, because masking, of course, lightens shadows and darken high values, and you don't want this funny color coming out. Which brings up something that I mentioned earlier about filter burning and filter dodging. You can actually use this to dodge with. If your shadows are coming out magenta, then you would use a magenta filter when you dodge that area. So it would become more green. Don't forget, magenta is going to make it more green. And if you wanted to burn and it was getting pink in your high values, you could get a cardboard with a hole in it, put a filter on now, the hole and burn that area. And so filter burning and filter dodging was a... Um, um, specialized technique that good printers utilize. You can also change the filtration in the enlarger when you do the burning. But then you have to remember to go back to the original filter. The setting of the filters when you print another, the next print, right? If you're making 10 prints, it's kind of a hassle to do that. So people prefer to use filters like this. And it has to be CC filters because you don't want to degrade the image by printing through plastic that bent the light funny okay that's what I wanted to say now okay graphing a data okay I'm giving you guys a lot of information just so that it'll be there it's just there on YouTube and you guys can refer to it and go back. And these videos should be watched many times, okay? I don't expect you to get all this in one viewing. Um, control strips. Every lab had to run control strips. And basically what control strips were, they were prints made by Eastman Kodak or Fuji, or whoever whoever the paper manuf manufacturer was, they would sell control strips. And they would have this. It would have black, light gray, middle gray, and white. And the control strips were not processed. They were frozen. You're supposed to keep it in the freezer, and you process it every day. They do give you a reference, one that they process. So Kodak would process one at, under ideal conditions. This is what it should look like. And you would measure what, uh, you would use a densitometer to measure what Kodak processed. And you would process one every day and you compare yours against Kodak's and you would plot it. So if you had um, your whites and you had an aim, You had your blacks, you had an aim, and you had your midtone aim. Every day of the week, you put the date, and you would plot. Oh, this is where we are. Uh, the red came here, the green came in, and you would plot, and it would go, and and the grays, and you would plot. There would be three plots: one for red, green, and blue, red, green. And your idea was it maintained close to the aim as possible but it would inevitably do something like this and if it did that then your chemistry is going bad or your heater went off or the replenishment rate is where someone mixed the chemistry wrong and you know you, you'd be alerted before you processed work 
um, to, to fix it before you process someone's film because control strips came for paper as well as for film. Every type of process, whether it was ectochrome process or uh, C41 negative film process. Back then we had C22 and before RA4 we had EP, EP2. We, we had five chemicals for the seven chemicals for, for processing colored paper back in the early 60s. So anyway, control shifts have always been there, and presumably they're still here today. And that's what you do as a professional lab person. You would plot and make sure your equipment and your chemistry was right. Now, when you do this every day, you could plot it. And that's what our software did. It would plot every dark room, and it would you'd be able to see um, how tight your control was. Now, typically, we were told that people would come into your lab any given time to ask to see your plots. So let me see your plots before I give you my film to process. And you'd give them, and if it looked good to you, then he said, okay, you can process my film. Well, nothing's to prevent a lab technician from showing you fake plots, <laughs> which some labs did. So not, that, was, that was no real insurance there. Um, quite often people would complain about the color of their transparencies and you know, they're shooting in open shade and they get this cyan slide and they're blaming the lab. Well, it's, the film's not made for shade, it's made for daylight, you know, you're shooting the sun. <laughs> anyway, um, okay. So that's why when you do this, you should make a master exposure on the film you're shooting, you're printing. If you have two types of film that you always use, make one for each one, because they're gonna have different slopes, okay? And a different color base. I mean, you can correct for the base, obviously, but that doesn't necessarily mean you can correct for the midtones, right? So you should shoot a master on any film that you typically use. If you use three films, have three masters, okay? And maintain them. It's not a big deal. It's just make a five, a four by five print every time you're gonna process. And you don't have to plot it, but you just update your master. So yesterday was 30L, today is 29, whatever, okay? And you can determine your uh, correction with the reflection that's timer, which is what I'm talking about next, okay? Okay, so if I press this button, it goes from transmission to reflection. Now it's going to reflect. It's going to measure what's reflected off of the print. Okay. And you need to use, to set the zero on this, you have a um, check block, which allows you to zero this. And it's set to be zero seven, zero eight, zero seven, and zero seven. Um, and the gray should be about point nine five. So if you measure the gray, if you don't zero, you just measure to confirm. It's point nine four, which is close in the black. It's one eight six. 184, 183, 181, yeah, 181 for cyan, 185 for magenta, 184, so it's pretty close. So you, you calibrate, if it's way off, you can calibrate to show you how to do that, but if it's correct, then you're, you're set, you, you are now able to read this patch and this says 82, 78, 80. That's this one. If I read this one, it reads 49, 49, 47. So that could be your aim. Okay, if this is my aim, then on Monday when I make a new one and it's a little bit off, it's gonna give me different readings and I'll use math to get back to my aim, okay? So that's what we're going to talk about next.
So I'm gonna turn this around. And it's essentially is similar. It's um let's see. Can you... So if your aim is seventy five. 75, 75, that's gray. It's a middle gray, okay? And if you test it and it comes out to be 90, 85, 80, okay, it's pretty far off and you should run another one until you get close to this, okay? But this average density is 0.75. This average, 90 plus 85 plus 80 divided by 3 is 85. Okay, so it's 0.102 dark. Okay, that means you're going to cut your exposure. Okay, how much you cut? That chart doesn't work for this. Okay, and this is what I have to explain why. And if you, re I'll refer you to my lesson number two of fourteen. Initially, I planned to make fourteen lessons, and the second lesson I talk about paper response to exposure and I used I made this for that lesson and this is black and white but it'll suffice here um, this is a Kodak 21 silver step tablet which covers um, has steps of half stop that means that the film that made this contact print has um, densities that are 0.15 apart. So two steps is 0.3. So it has 21 steps, which covers 10 stops. And this is just a contact print. And in that lesson, I print for different contrast grades. Well, grade two is our normal. So I'm just going to look at grade two here, okay? And on the bottom here, hopefully you can see this. I've got reflection readings off of this print. That means I put this here and I measured it. Okay, this is this this is middle gray. And it's a little bit dark. This measures 0.89. Okay, and that measures 0.59. Okay, so right in the middle. That's your middle gray. It's 0.75 falls in between there. Okay. And the difference between this part of the film that made this exposure and this one is only 0.15. It's only half a stop. And yet I'm getting a one stop change in density. 0.89 minus 0.59 is 0.3, right? Minus five nine is point three or thirty. You know, I didn't put the point in it, but thirty. Okay. So a half stop in film change causes a one stop change in reflectance value. So therefore, your gamma is point five. You get twice the effect when you're on paper than you would expect. I remember one time I was, I went to a Macbeth demonstration and this guy was talking about this stuff and, and he shows that one stop is 0.3 and, and he goes to the Macbeth dance time and, and therefore, if you want um, 
to correct the color by 15 points, you change and enlarge by 15. I said, well, that's only true if your characteristic curve is a straight line and it's not. And he looks at me like, you're right, but I'm just trying to teach a class here. Kind of give me a break. He doesn't want to go into the detail. <laughs> he looked at me really strange, like I caught him giving false information. Well, the gamma is um, this basically the amount of change that paper will give, given how much change in density will get based on how much change in exposure you give. And the change is dramatic. You get double the change. So you don't, you don't need um, 30 point density change in order to get a 30 point change. You want to get a 30 point change, you only need 0.15. You only need half a stop change. You get that much, which this proves. Okay, that's why even though you got 10 stops, you don't need to see that. You can't utilize all, you know, you. Anyway, go, go to lesson 2 of 14 if you want to know uh, more specifically how, what, what I'm talking about there. But in short, you do half of this, okay? This chart, you only do half of this in order to affect the change you want. So here, if um, you want to cut by, what did I say it was, 0.10, you don't cut 21%. You only cut half of that or you know, 10%. And you'll get a big change. Not, probably not 10 because this is logarithmic. But anyway, 12%, 50 I don't know. Does that make sense? Oh, anyway. This is true also for filtration. Okay. So. This is 90, which means the red is being stopped more than the green and the blue. So the red is being stopped because there's more blue in the gray, right? And the red is being stopped because there's more green in the gray. So this is a cyan colored uh, gray. This is what it's telling you, okay? So again, if that's your aim, obviously 75 minus 75 is zero, zero, right? So 80 minus 90 is 10, a negative 10. 85 minus 90 is a negative five. So you need to subtract yellow, but not 10, five. You have to cut this in half, okay? Subtract five, subtract two and a half magenta. Because your gamma of paper approximately um, 0.5, okay? So you have to cut this in half. So that's minus five yellow, minus two and a half magenta. And then this will look more gray. And you can plot it. But if, you're, if your master is that far off, I would suggest that you test it again. It shouldn't be that far off. Especially the density shouldn't be that far off, okay? Again, you have to have an on-easel uh, on meter maintaining a constant light level, okay? Now we get to the hard part, <laughs> color correction. Um, should I recap that? No, I don't. It's essentially the same math as this, except you have to cut the correction in half now, okay? Um, because 
paper responds quickly to changes in filtration and exposure. Here, when you're when you're adjusting the exposure, when you're adjusting the exposure to accommodate film, you're just trying to match, right? Your, your, the light source is adjusted to so that the light passing through this through this is going to be the same as the light passing through that and then you'll get this because you're going on the same paper the same chemistry you're going to get the same result okay but when you when you're coming up to color correction proper actual color correction um you have to back off on your corrections because paper responds rather quickly to changes okay which this shows illustrates This is the, the hardest part of color correction. Quite frankly, many people never get, understand color correction. They don't get it. Um, you have to be able to see the right direction to color correct. Stay close to the camera so you can hear me. Yet I want you to see all this. Okay. Okay. Um, the most important thing in color correction is getting the density right. Once your density is close, when you look at the color, you have to know that. The difference between the colors. Quite often, people will mistake green for yellow. They'll mistake magenta for blue. Red is often mistaken for magenta. You have to be able to see that this is red and that's magenta, right? That's magenta blue, so that's the worst because you get a combination of problems there. Um, this is yellow and that's green, right? Magenta, yellow, green. This is cyan and, you know, you have to be able to, to see that. And these do help, although these are... So if you, theoretically, if you're off in yellow, okay, which is here, and you look at that through there and you look at the gray, you can see that you approach... The, the grays look better through this than anything else, okay? But a lot of people never get to the point where they can actually use this. This, this is blue, but it kind of looks like magenta, right? So you have to, and then this is red. So, what I tell the 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 employees.
employees that I trained in color correction, what I told them was, um, use this for direction. Don't use it for um, exact. I mean, you may look something may look better to you using a thirty instead of a twenty because a thirty is stronger. Oh yes, yeah. but that doesn't mean you're going to use thirty when you do the color correction. Number number one, you have to cut these in half. All right. And it's different than when you hold it up to your eye and when you put it right down on the print. What this is good for is proportions. It's, it's good for proportions. And by proportions, what I mean is you combine this with other ones. So if you, you never put yellow and blue together because they're opposites. You're just going to get neutral density. You can combine this with cyan. Okay, so there's a 10 cyan. Here's a 30 blue. When you combine it, and it helps the gray to move in the direction you want, it's, ah, oh, I also have to uh, look at it through some green, because don't forget, 10 cyan is 10 blue and 10 green. So this is what looks good. This is a proportion of one part green to four parts blue. You got 30 blue and a 10 cyan. That's 30 blue and another 10 blue here, right? That's four parts of blue to one part green. So this means it's one to four. That's the proportion. If this is what looks good to you, then you have to look at the print and say, okay, thinking in terms of four, that means four, eight, 12. That's staying within a ratio of four. If I'm gonna subtract 12, I'm going to add 12 yellow, okay? The proportion is such that I'm going to have to add 1 to 4, right? 4 divided into 12 goes 3 times. I have to add 3 magenta. So if I have 40 blue and 10 cyan, that equals 10 blue and 10 green. This is, I, had, this is, I used 30 here. This 30, okay. That equals 40 blue and 10 green. That's a proportion of four to one. If I use if I use twelve, I'm going to need four divided into twelve goes three times. I mean, I'm going to use three green. Okay, that's the proportion. The filters are most useful in terms of getting the right proportion of color. Then you have to think in terms of how far off is my print based on the color ring around. If it's this far off, there's 12 here, right? If it's this far off, there's 12 here, 12 here, 12 here. Okay, if it's this far off, here's 15, right? And based on those proportions, if you move the larger color by this much, you have to stay with the same proportion moving the secondary color. And that's how the filters should be used. No one taught me that. I learned that over years of doing it. And when I trained that way, it made more sense to my trainees than trying to, well, if it's, it's this strong, if it's this close to your eye, if it's this strong, if you're, the closer you get to the print, that's, that's didn't work too well. But So you've got different proportions. If it's 10 blue, and here you use, let's say you use five green, then you've got 15 blue and five green. 
Now your proportion is 1 to 3, right? Right? So you've got these proportions 4, 1, 3, 1, 1 to 2, and 1 to 5. That's about it. 1 to 2, 1 to 3, 1 to 4, 1 to 5. Those are the proportions you're going to be using. Okay? You might use 2 to 3, or you might use 3 to 4. But you're not going to, you're not going to deviate from this too much. Okay? All right? So for an example... Let's say you used 20 red and 20 yellow, and that looked good to you, right? That's not, that's two parts of yellow, I mean, and two parts of yellow. So you got 40 yellow here and only 20 magenta. So that's one to two. All right. That winds up to be this proportion. There's no way around practicing. And if you're printing at home your own negatives, you get a fairly limited amount of practice. If you're color correcting for 10 printers <laughs> and every two minutes, they're people are coming to you for color correct you get a lot of practice and you're you're not always right you're you're, you're going to make mistakes you, you know, sometimes the printer goes in the wrong direction and print comes out way off and left field because they added instead of subtracted and that's that happens but the more you do this the more it makes sense and you get to the point where even half a point can make or break a print depending on the subject matter especially if it's half a point of a color and darkening this corner so that your eye doesn't go there and, and then all of a sudden the print works. Um, there are people who pride themselves on being really good at color correction and that's what they do. And um, every lab has one, at least one. <laughs> I've had so many printers tell me that uh, so many color correction people say, I'm the best at color correction. No one's better than I am. And you know, we all feel that way, right? Because you, you, you get so sensitive to, uh, to getting to this point, right? That's another thing. Getting to this point is just your starting point. You know, you have to be sensitive to the print. Because from here, you can go a little bit here, a little bit here. And, and the print will be better. Um, you don't always want perfect gray. Even that master I showed you, it wasn't a perfect, it wasn't 75. 75, 75, 75 tends to look a little bit yellow. Okay? So, um, you go to that as your zero point. You get there and then you have to pay attention to the subject matter, the feeling behind the print, and you lean toward the direction you want. Color correction is hard to teach, and I don't know what else to tell you. Proportions is the way to go if you have filters. Um, because if all that math and all that, you come out and say, okay, so the print comes out with a neutral gray. Now what? It doesn't look good. <laughs> well, maybe it doesn't look good because the contrast is too low or the contrast is too high or the gray area doesn't matter so much. It's it's just an anchor. Now I have to get the green trees to feel like they're blowing in the wind. How do I do that? How do I, how do I, well, I need more contrast here. I need less contrast here. So then you're, then you're dealing with filter burning or just regular burning and dodging and, and getting the print to come alive, you know. The color correction has to be there because if it's not, it's too distracting. The colors are often, it's like, those shadows are muddy brown. It just detracts, it, 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 the print, there's no way the print's gonna work with that color in the shadow. So the color correction has to be, you know, pretty 
dead on. If you want, we're talking about fine art photography, right? We're not talking about just run of the mill prints that people put in an album. You know, this is something that you're going to be working on. You you, you shot and you you're going to frame and put on your wall. It's going to be there for years, and you, you want the right feeling from it. Okay, which is. I'd be the first one to say it's not an easy thing, especially if you're discriminating, if you're really honest with yourself, um, what's it going to take so that I can sleep at night? After all this work on this image, it still doesn't work, and it, it'll bug you until you, you, at least you get to a certain point where it's close to what you want, okay? So... The ring around really helps. Although I stopped using a ring around many, many years ago. But this is how I started. Okay. And I didn't really get good at color correction until my father said he's going to China. And I would have to run the lab. I'd have to everyone had to give me their color. And I had to figure out how to um, color correct um, for all the printers overnight. My father came back from China. I was good at it. You know, he didn't have to do it anymore. Uh, back in what, 77? 1977. Okay, so. Next. God, this, we're on the tail end of this thing. Okay. I want to talk about. <clears throat> it means to make a fine color print I've talked a lot about the black and white black and white you're dealing with um, local contrast getting your print to really stand out and, and sing you know you, you juxtapose certain tones together and it just comes alive the same tones in a different area of the print will just look okay but if you put them you know then all of a sudden it, it looks three-dimensional, it feels three-dimensional. And you're able to highlight the subject matter, whatever feeling you're trying to get um, comes through local contrast. And the whole basis behind film masking was to address that, okay? Because when you photograph, the lighting is almost never perfect. You know, you, it's a great feeling that you have looking at this subject but when you shoot it you're left you, you come away with oh gee it's just not it's just not what i this is not why i expose it it doesn't feel right so then you work at it you work at it and sometimes it takes years and when you get it you feel oh now i can let it go it's done and you go on to the next one well in color it's similar except the value system is different because you're dealing with color and quite often color can be really distracting. Um, people will shoot things just because it's colorful. Um, but that's quite often not enough. Sometimes you don't want so much color because it pulls away, it pulls your eye away from what it is you're trying to highlight in a photograph. Okay, so I picked something to, sh to go over with you. Um, back in 2004, 2005, I became friends with Robert Cameron, who is known as an aerial photographer. He shot above San Francisco, London, Paris, New York, Chicago, Hawaii. <laughs> he went all over the world. And he, he would publish these books, coffee table books. And he'd shoot from a helicopter or airplane. He started with a 4x5 camera. His first book was above San Francisco back in 72, 73. And... Um, because of the vibration, even though he had a large format camera, the vibration caused his films not to be. So he wound up with um, this. 
This is Bob's, um, one of Bob's cameras I inherited. He had a gyro. It was a stabilizer. So he would use this in the air and shoot six by seven original film and get incredibly sharp images. He's always shooting at infinity, probably 125th to 250th of the second, usually 5.6 or eight. I mean, he, he didn't need 22 because the depth of focus was, he was always focused on infinity. So he had these really insanely sharp images. And I convinced him to try to think about doing a portfolio. I would print it and we'd be partners in this endeavor. And so he, the first image he gave me was above the Golden Gate Bridge, which um, he called his Dalé <laughs> image. This is the original here, which I prepared for masking, of course. So this, the helicopter had run out of... Uh, helicopter was running out of fuel so he's headed back to the airport and he had to grab this when he as soon as he saw it he leaned over and he shot it now he had already taken off the stabilizer so he had to hold it steady and and he grabbed it and he he wasn't able to uh, have the pilot stay there and take more shots because the fuel was low and they don't gamble like that in the air so he gave me this transparency he says this is my dolly what he meant was it's kind of surreal um it has a surreal quality to it and this is this in the book This is, this got to be one of his favorite images. Um, he's actually pretty well known for this particular image. And again, because of the surreal quality, I don't like the way they cropped it. <laughs> They're always straightening horizons and stuff. In his, anyway, um, so I worked on it and this is what I came up with. So this is a C print. It's getting a reflection. This tripod doesn't go high enough. Anyway, um, obviously the color's been adjusted. I didn't like that muddy uh, greenish 
color that was in yellow green in the in the in the original that, that translated to the book. And I did this. Bob said I turned it into a wow photograph. He called it a wow photograph. But I I wanted I wanted the the water to look like it was a blanket blowing in the wind, which this really had that feeling for me. And other than that, I just wanted to separate the bridge from the background. Um, as if the image was a toy bridge. And even these little cars were just placed there by a little child and he's and it feels really man-made. It's obviously um, man-made, but the bridge is never, not, not normally considered a toy, but it has this toy-like feeling. It's like a, um, an illusion of reality. The feeling of the print is that... Um, The water is not real in, in a certain respect. And the bridge is plastic. Um, so it does have this surreal feeling about it. And it doesn't um, feel the same way when... I make a black and white of this, which I did. So I'll get that too, okay? Now this was after Bob passed away. So Bob has never seen the black and white. I think I'm gonna have to hold this and damage this print. print looks more like a monument um, of San Francisco you know it, it certainly is a uh, landmark a San Francisco landmark and that's kind of how it comes out it's less surreal okay it's, it's not it, it, it looks like the going to get, it looks like a nice shot of going to get a bridge and you may prefer this over this but that definitely has a surreal look to it. And it, although it's a real bridge, um, it feels man-made. Now this is, um, okay, now this is, Bob's picture of Yosemite, half dome, half dome is uh, shot from a helicopter. It looks, come, it looks like Ansel Adams from the ear or something. That's not man-made, right? That definitely is made by nature. So it has a totally different feel. And so the point is, when you make a print, you have to be sensitive to the aim. You have to have an aim. You can't just go into the dark room and just print. The stronger the feeling is, the harder you're going to work. The more direction you're going to have when you work. Um, the Golden Gate Bridge was important because it was the lead image. If Bob didn't like it, we would have killed the portfolio. We would have stopped there. But because it was successful, we continued. We did all. We did 18 of his favorite images. Signed them, and you know, I. <laughs> 
I didn't make any money from Portfolio because I just got enough, he sold enough copies to cover the cost of the paper in chemistry. But then he passed away. Matter of fact, we were working on a second folio when he decided to call it quits. Um, he, uh, he lost the sight in his last, he lost the last of his sight in his one good eye. And he was 98 and he was tired, so he um, passed away at 98. And the second folio, even though I made, he signed a bunch of them, uh, it was never finalized, it was never signed off by Bob, but I have those images. So between the first folio and the second folio, I did quite a bit of work in color of Bob's. The second folio also included one black and white, the black and white of Louis Armstrong. He shot in 1941 or 42 in St. Louis, and Bob Dylan was not happy about that. He wanted all the pictures to be aerial shots. And I said, well, this is one of your best shots, Bob. You knew Louis Armstrong, and this is a great shot. He's actually playing. You can see the spit rolling down his face. And we got in an argument over that. <laughs> but, and I reminded him, you told me I could pick for the second folio, so this is what I'm picking. Tough. You don't like it? <laughs> and we didn't speak for about two weeks after that or something like that. But anyway, we wound up being good friends. He left me his stuff. The point is, you have to be sensitive to photograph. If you're honest with yourself, you won't stop. You'll keep doing it until it gets to a certain point where you can let it go and say, okay, this is pretty good. Now, maybe I can do better, but this works. And then you go on to the next one you, and you release it. Very seldom do I get to the point where I feel like it's 100%. The Louis Armstrong got there after Bob died. Bob signed the initial prints that I did of the Louis Armstrong. I always thought I could do better. I kept masking, I kept doing it, and figuring out how to do it. And, and now I'm really happy with it. Unfortunately, Bob's gone and he wasn't able to see the final, but um, that's how you do it. You, you, you're, you're super critical of what you've done and honest about whether you can do better. And you stick at it. All this other stuff, the math, the densitometer, the filters, and the equipment, that's all secondary. The main thing is, are you getting the feeling that you want, at least to you, when you look at it, are you getting um, that sense of success? And, it, and a good test is to put the print up and look at it every day. After a year, two years, if you still like it, it's pretty good, you know. Um, and then you let it go and you go on to the next one. I think, to be honest with yourself, is really important in doing this kind of work because it's too easy to do things to impress others. Other people tell you you're a great photographer and you feel great. You make money at it, you sell prints, and you, that's enough reason to do it. And as soon as you're selling a print for money, you think it's good enough. Obviously, people are paying for it. But if you're honest with yourself, is it good enough? And that's the difference. Um, It's quite all, I mean, I, I've walked away from people um, giving me work because, you know, what they wanted was unreasonable. You know, they didn't want a good picture. They just wanted to give you a hard time, you know, because they wanted a power over you. It could cost you a lot in terms of business, right? But that's what I did. Okay, so that's my lesson on color. A lot of math, a lot of calculations. Hopefully everything makes sense. Get all your ducks in a row. 
and then do work that is meaningful. If it's not meaningful, then nothing else matters. I mean, you're basically a scientist in a dark room. You know, that's all. And that's not very thrilling. The, the idea is to make photographs that have are have a lot of feeling behind them and then when you are done you feel really good you know I wound up good at this stuff because I had an interest in it and I didn't study it but I would read books and I'd test this and I um and I close my lab and this is what I know. So this is what, you know, aside from playing guitar, this is what I do. And in um, the first chapter of the Analytics, the first line, um, which is a collection of sayings by Confucius, the student says of the master, um, the master said to put to practice what you know isn't that delightful isn't that happiness and that's what it is just using what you know and everything else that I know I'm just using it and I'm trying to share it with you it's not the end you, you don't learn this stuff just to learn it you learn it to practice it to use it okay okay so that's it <laughs>